Uh, very good evening to all of you. I welcome you all for this uh, first uh, academic session by several parts the FIG. And uh, we'll be having a, a case, interesting case presentation on CP mimics from different institutes of the country. I'd like to uh, request our president, Dr. Shafal Gulati, ma'am, to introduce the moderator and expert for today's session. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Mahesh. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as you promised that every Wednesday we are going to have a session and trying to have interesting sessions with interactions from all across India and beyond. So we were having this uh, first session in which the most important thing is what is not CP? So CP or not CP is very important. And with the upcoming genetics, there are a lot of CP mimics which are there. And there is a lot of role of precision medicine coming with relation to CP mimics. So we would be uh, having case presentations uh, of you know, from across India for various CP mimics. Uh, the SIG is led by Professor Pratibha Singhi. She's the patron. And then we have uh, Dr. Uh, Prashant Utage as the convener from the EB. Then we have Dr. Raju as the convener from the non-EB. And we have uh, Dr. Diptan Shu, the member secretary. And many of our members whose names you have on the flyer and who are there on the panelist thing, they are there. So, but today's uh, session uh, will be moderated by Dr. Raju. And he will be, I'm requesting him to be careful about the time. We should be mindful of the time so that the beginning people don't get more time and the less end don't, I mean, get less time. And we should not be spilling out beyond time. So we're starting seven minutes late. We should not be beyond seven minutes later than that. That would be something important. And we have two experts, as we have experts every time. We have uh, one, um, uh, you know, expert who is a friend for long, Professor Narayan Saha from Dhaka, Bangladesh, who is uh, a very senior pediatric neurologist. And uh, we go back 25 years uh, in our association. Yeah. Thanks. He's a very dear friend. Thanks for joining. And another dear friend from the country and uh, from Kochi, um, uh, Dr. K.P. Vinayan. And uh, we're very grateful to both of them to have joined. And uh, I don't think Dr. Vinayan needs any introduction in our forum, right? He is an entity in himself, but our dear friend. Thank you, Dr. Vinayan, for joining. And uh, we over to you, Raju. And after six minutes, you know, you please time it. You just uh, unmute and say two minutes left so that, you know, you know. So it's eight minutes uh, of presentation and two minutes discussion, which you have shared with everybody. And in case uh, Dr. Singhi joins, um, uh, Smita, you let me know. And then I will, uh, you know, in between uh, cases, we'll ask her to speak. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vinayan uh, and Dr. Saha, you will give some opening remarks before Raju asks for the first case. Dr. Vinayan. Yeah, that, uh, Dr. Vinayan, Dr. Yeah, Saha, yeah. some opening remarks. Yeah, yeah thank you, Shafali, for uh, inviting me here today. And uh, I think, as you rightly told, CP and CP mimics as it's the, the, it's, there is a lot of change in the recent past with the genetics and other metabolic investigations, which is opening up a lot of lot of new etiologies there. So I think uh, we can hear the cases and then can have discussions. Over to yeah. Dr. Saha. Dr. Saha, Dr. Uh, yeah. Saha. Yeah, thank you, ma'am, uh, for asking me to be present about this year, about this presentation. Probably we will have a very good interaction along with the all participants as well as the presence regarding the CP mavics. Actually, as the professor Binan already told, there is a lot of change in the era of advanced medical genetics. Uh, previously, probably we will not been able to detect all these cases. Probably we have already broadly labeled as CP syndrome or CP mavics nowadays. There is a scope for a, a exploration of etiology in uh, suspected cases and probably We'll, the beginner will learn a lot from this today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Raju. Now it's all yours. Yours yes, to manage yes. or mismanage. Huh? Yes. I hope you manage. Yes. Yeah. yes. Good evening, Tohal. Uh, so today we'll be having the six case uh, discussions uh, from different institutes. So I request all uh, uh, presenters to stick to the time. So presentation uh, approximately eight minutes and followed by discussion for two minutes. So I request first uh, presenter to start presenting uh, Dr. Apoorva from Rainbow Children's Hospital, Hyderabad. Yes, uh, is the screen uh, visible, uh, sir? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Mm. Okay, thank you, sir. 
गुड मॉर्निंग टुडे माय केस इज अ केस ऑफ स्पास्टिक डायप्लीजिया अपूर्वा अपूर्वा जस्ट वन सेकंड कैन यू वन सेकंड जस्ट वेट डॉक्टर सिंगी हैज जॉइंड मैडम सिंगी वुड यू लाइक टू गिव सम ओपनिंग रिमार्क्स दिस इज द फर्स्ट सेशन सिंगी मैम मैम इज सेड दैट शी इज जॉइंड Asmita is Dr. Pratibha Singhi there. She said she just joined. Okay, then you can continue and that. And one thing, I'll uh, I'll talk to you on board. You start. Sorry, please start. Then we'll ask her to speak in between the first and second. Please. please. Sorry, please continue. Time starts now. Okay, it's sorry for interrupting. Dr. Purba. Can... I'm sharing the screen again, sir. there any issues sir uh, so i'm not in uh, asmita dr singhi has joined she is un unable to unmute can you help her out can you see her if you can't see her then we'll talk to her and you can start the presentation yeah okay i think she is not in the panelist link then probably that is ah yeah decline the request madam is there i think we can start with uh, okay yeah yeah you can start it okay please making to a slide show Uh, my case is a case of a spastic diaplegia. Can you make it to the slide slow, sir? Yeah. Uh, so this is a 14-year-old girl uh, who, around one year of age, presented with uh, parents notice that there is delay in the attainment of the milestones, uh, such that in the gross motor domain, neck holding was at five months, sitting with support at eight months, standing with support at one and a half year. The slides are not moving. Sli slides are not moving. Just put it on yeah, side. Now it is okay. Just click on enter, enter. Still in editing mode. Is it moving? No, now it is moving. You should make into slide slow. Yeah, it is slide show me. No, no, ma'am. Full slide. Because uh, when you bar, hello. Hello. Is, uh, sir, this is in slide show mode only. Yeah. yeah. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Just one second while you set it in right, ma'am. Uh, Doctor Singhi, ma'am, you like to say something, please. Hi. Thanks no, for joining. No, I'm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As I said, I'm sorry. I was in an international meeting. Can you hear yes, me now? I because I've yes, been trying yes, to speak, but yes, you know. Yes, So, so. Mm. Introductory remarks from you, ma'am. Okay. Now I think that's better. Can you see me? perfect yes ma'am uh -huh. okay so i'm i'm really glad that this has taken off and that we have these number of cases and i would just say that we should continue with this enthusiasm i won't take much time because already it's getting a bit uh, into the time but uh, it's very important that you know these basic things are spread and uh, i'm really glad that we started with this cpmmx thing and i congratulate all of you who have organized this thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much for sparing your valuable time yeah. and your guidance and blessings ma'am thank you need that always raju up to you i will not interfere yes, you raju no apurva you can start to present
can start now. Uh, this is a 14 year old a female child who presented with uh, uh, around one year of age. Parents noticed delay in the attainment of the milestones uh, such that in the developmental domain, the, in the gross motor domain, neck holding was around five months, sitting with support at eight months, standing Should with move your slides, please. Slides are not moving. Is it moving? No, next not slide yet. is not in it's not in full screen mode, Apurva. Uh, sir, I, what I am seeing it is. Full... Sir, this, Apurva, this is Apurva, I'll tell you one second. I'll just tell you one second, Apurva. Apurva, mail to Asmita. One second. Mail yes. to Asmita. We have the second presenter now. You mail to Asmita. You be the number two now. There's some issue with your connection, beta. Mail to Asmita. Asmita, okay. you talk to her on a uh, personal phone, huh? And uh, you can uh, minimize your screen. You can have the second presentation first if it's okay with you. Ramesh is okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, fine, man. Yeah, yeah. She mails to Asmita. Asmita, you reach out to her. Huh? Please, right now. Yeah. Please drop your number on the... So, shall I start the second presentation? Absolutely. The second presentation uh, by Dr. Santosh from uh, Indra Gandhi Institute of Child Health. Dr. Santosh? Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Can I start, sir? Yes, you can start. In the case of uh, developmental delay with dyskinesia, my mentor is Dr. Vaikuntaraja, sir. Uh, this is a two-year, seven-month-old male child, uh, Master SM, who was informant was the mother, with reliable source, hailing from West Bengal, presented with chief complaints of delayed attainment of milestones, feeding difficulty, breathing difficulty since five months of age, and paroxysmal events noted since seven months of age, mm -hmm. stone abnormalities. I would like to start from birth history. Antenatally, the mother had urinary tract infection at around five months of amenorrhea. She perceived the fetal movements well. The child was born at term. Cesarean section indication was failure to progress with birth weight of three kgs set up quite soon after birth. Was breastfed initially after two hours after birth with a history of neonatal bilirubinia on day six of life. Mother's blood group was B positive. Babies was not known. And discharge after seven days of hospital stay with no feeding issues noted during that time. Coming to developmental milestones, in gross motor, neck control was achieved around four months, rollover not attained, no pull to sit was there, sits when made to sit. Fine motor, only fisting was there, no reaching out for objects. Language, cooing, as well as monosyllables by one year, five months, and bisyllables by two years. Social smile by 10 months, recognizing mother by around one year, three months, and understanding emotions could not wave bye-bye. The maximum developmental age in gross motor was five to six months. Fine motor was one to two months, as well as uh, language was one year, and personal and social was seven to eight months. There was gradual regression of milestones noted since the last five months of age, and currently the child had no neck control, spasticity with cortical thumb, with no expressive speech, as well as uh, the child was just consolable by, by the mother. With vision and hearing, no concerns. Overall impression was GDD, followed by regression of milestones more to modern cognition, with no vision and hearing concerns. Coming to the other complaints, breathing difficulty noted first from five months of age, which was insidious in onset, associated with noisy breathing and strider, more during the awake state associated with chest in drawing was evaluated elsewhere in a private hospital and was opined as laryngomalacia and were reassured. Feeding difficulty, the child oh. used to take time to feed with difficulty in swallowing as well as pooling of secretions in the oral cavity, which is noted, followed by intermittent episodes of vomiting and regurgitation of feeds. And uh, for these issues, the child was put on NG feeds from the age of one year, two months. The child used to choke and also had difficulty feeding. The other complaints was paroxysmal event in the form of uh, noted first from the age of seven months, jerks noted in sleep, none in awake state or on, on awakening, five to six episodes per night, each lasting for around a few seconds. This child was admitted in multiple hospitals, evaluated for the same, uh, put on multiple anti-seizure uh, medications. Coming to the next complaint, that is the tone abnormalities. History of decreased sleep was noted since five to six months, with history of inability to move the limbs completely above the plane of the bed, with history of tone abnormalities noted in the form of looseness while trying to hold up the child or while turning the child, and history of increased stiffening of the limbs with regards to time, with some abnormal movements of the distal extremities as explained by the mother. There was history suggestive of other cranial nerve involvement in the form of taking longer time to feed as well as difficulty in chewing as well as uh, swallowing, and uh, there is no history suggestive of visual or hearing impairment, no history suggestive of sensory system abnormalities, no history suggestive of uh, cerebellar system involvement, no history suggestive of raised ICP or meningeal irritation. No history of constipation, excess sweating, weight gain or loss, or hair and skin changes. 
overall significant to sum up the HOPA, that is delayed development with regression along with tone abnormalities with feeding and respiratory concerns as well as paroxysmal events. Coming to the past history, there were two hospital admissions in the past at five months and one year, two months for complaints of hurried breathing more than fever and cough and cold during that time, along with delayed attainment of milestones. There's also a history of recurrent respiratory illnesses for which the child was, had received symptomatic treatment. And uh, there was also history on uh, retrospective asking the parents. They said there was history of longer time to recover post the febrile illness as well as poor activity during that time. Uh, most probable impression of this history was a recurrent febrile encephalopathy. The child was immunized last at one and a half years of age with BC scar present. First born to non consanguinously married parents with no significant uh, complaints in the family or similar complaints in the family, belong belonging to BG Prasad's third class three. Summarizing the history, a two years, seven months old male child, first born to non consanguinously married parents with uh, birth history suggestive of neonatal hyperbilumia on day six, immunized for age, presented with delay development with regression with tone abnormalities, along with feeding and respiratory concerns, paroxysmal activity, and recurrent febrile encephalopathy. The differentials which I would like to consider at the end of the history were neurometabolic with cerebral palsy, hypomelanating leukodystrophies, and structural malformation. Going on to the examination, the vitals were more or less stable with anthropometry, weight 11.3, 0 to minus 2 standard deviation, length of 100 centimeters plus 2 to plus 3, and head circumference of 43 between minus 1 to minus 2 standard deviation. There was mild pallor with no ictus, sinuses clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or no edema was noted. Head to the examination, there was strabismus with mild right exotropia seen with facial dysmorphism in the form of upslanting palpebral fissures, dysmorphic ears, as well as tented upper lips. Uh, the cortical thumb with obligatory ATNR was also noted with uh, dystonia. Coming to central nervous system examination, the child was conscious oriented to person with uh, other cranial nerves more or less normal except the right exotropia and otherwise ninth and 10th gag was brisk. Motor system examination, there was generalized wasting with uh, spastic quadriparesis with variable tone with dystonia and choreoarthritis. This is visible in this video, some amount of uh, peripheral movements in the form of uh, mild, chore slow breathing movements in the form of uh, choreoarthritoid movements. And uh, coming to the power, uh, shoulder abduction adduction was 2 plus with elbow flexion extension was 3 plus with wrist flexion was 3 plus and extension was 3 hip flexion extension was 2 by 5 with uh, knee flexion extension was 3 plus and dorsiflexion plantar flexion was 3 by 5 other systemic exam others other part of the cns examination reflexes were brisk with ankle clonus with bilateral plantar being extensor there were no cerebellar signs no signs of mental irritation there was some amount of scoliosis with uh, abnormal head shape and the impression was dystonia with chorea arthritis involuntary movements were seen other systemic examination was more or less normal. The diagnosis at the end of history and examination was the GDD with uh, regression of milestones, motor modern cognition, with spastic quadriparesis, with recurrent febrile encephalopathy, with strabismus, with query seizures, with dystonia, with choreoarthritoid movements, with dysmorphism, secondary to suspected neurometabolic bar, dyskinetic cerebral palsy bar, structural malformation bar, hypomyelinating leukodystrophy. Coming to the investigations, baseline investigations were more or less normal with just mild anemia, 10.8 of hemoglobin and metabolic workup was normal. Oftal and hearing evaluation was normal. MRI brain done showed uh, cerebellar atrophy with uh, corpus callosal uh, hypoplasia with uh, thinning of, uh, and as well as cerebral atrophy. And uh, along with uh, here, cere cerebellar atrophy is evident. Mild uh, hypomyelination is also noted in this image. EG done was normal at our center. Following which NCV was done, NCV was also normal. Uh, in this child, uh, we had done thyroid profile first initially TSH, which was supposed, which was uh, found to be elevated. Following which uh, free T3 and total T3 were elevated, and free T4 and uh, T4 were decreased. Impression of the thyroid results were at this thyroidism picture. Coming to points in favor and against the differentials considered, that is neurometabolic mitochondrial encephalopathy. Points in favor were developmental delay, regression of milestones, feeding difficulty, and recurrent febrile encephalopathy. Points against was there was no significant failure to thrive, and other systems were not involved. The next was the dyskinetic cerebral palsy. Points in favor was the hyperbilumina, which was noted with feeding difficulty and no history of HI. Points against were no HIE at birth, regression of milestones, including cognition milestones. Hypomyelinating leukodystrophies, points in favor. Developmental delay with regression of milestones. Points against were frequent paroxysmal events, one multiple anti-seizure medication, query seizures, cognitive regression, and no visual complaints that is known as seen. 
Following which we went ahead and did the whole exome sequencing in this child, wherein it showed an SLC 16A2 mutation on exon 3, which was an X-linked hemizygous condition responsible for allen hendron Judley syndrome. This was classified as uncertain significance, which we went on to further do Sanger and then confirmed by Sanger. And uh, other differentials based on this uh, diagnosis based on whole exome were uh, Pelicis and Melzbagger-like disease, where points in favor of uh, development delay with regression of milestones. Points against was, this was on, uh, in uh, PMD, it is uh, autosomal recessive inheritance, abnormal thyroid profile is against it, known as that. Was one minute, one minute left. Yes, yes, yes. And MECP2 duplication syndrome, points in favor is an X-linked inheritance, progressive spasticity with feeding difficulty, points against were abnormal thyroid profile. And uh, points in favor for Pelizius Mesbagger disease was X-linked inheritance, male presenting in early infancy with hypotonia and development in Lire, along with progressive spasticity. Points against were abnormal thyroid profile with no nystagmus, cognitive regression, and MRA, no diffuse hypomyelination. So final diagnosis was uh, GDD with more regression of milestones, motor more than cognition with spastic quadriparesis, with recurrent febrile encephalopathy, with strabismus, with sleep myoclonus, with dystonia, with chorioarthritis, with dysthyroidism, with dysmorphism, second it to allen hendron judley syndrome, which, which is SLC16A2, X-linked hemizygous mutation in exon 3. So I'll just briefly skip through other these slides and go to a summary and our center experience that is uh, four cases we had similarly mimicking a CP. Uh, these are the four set of four children which initially presented with global development and delay with regression of milestones in the first three case. And lately, the last one which we had seen had not yet had regression. All presented with dystonia. And uh, MRI showing, MRI picture was either normal to delayed myelination with some amount of uh, cerebellar and uh, cerebral atrophy. With uh, TSH, the th thyroid profile was was uh, peculiar, very peculiar and very significant in this case, which I'll give you a take-home note. Take-home note, allen hendron Dudley syndrome is otherwise MCTA deficiency, which is specific thyroid hormone cell membrane transport deficiency. It's an X-linked disorder. Seen in males, neurologic findings may mainly hypotonia, feeding difficulty in infancy, causing development delay as well as intellectual disability. With late onset pyramidal signs or extra pyramidal findings such as dystonia, choreoarthritis, and paroxysmal movement disorder, can have hypokinesia and masked, masked faces, <coughs> often with drug resistance. Dysthyroidism manifesting as poor weight gain, reduced ma muscle mass, variable cold, cold intolerance, sweating, elevated heart rate, irritability, and pathognomic test, thyroid test results. In the form of, there is a combination of hypothyroidism in the CNS with peripheral hyperthyroidism. The TSH can be normal or elevated with uh, total T3 and free T3 increased with reverse T3 being decreased and free T4 being free T4 and total T4 are decreased. It's a multi management coming. It's a multidisciplinary team approach with feeding issues and tone abnormalities for anti seizure for medications for the seizures and treatment. This molecule known as TRIAC is uh, basically <clears throat> it's a thyroid hormone analog aimed at improving the peripheral thyrotoxicosis and preventing the progression of neurological impairment. Finally, I would like to conclude saying diagnosis is especially important as cerebral palsy and thyroid disorders are commonly misdiagnosed as two more com that the presenting two more uh, common pediatric disorders. And it should be considered, that is, uh, allen hendron Dudley syndrome should be considered as a differential in any male presenting with GDD with tone abnormalities such as cerebral palsy specifically without perinatal complications, normal neuroimaging, and thyroid function suggestive of central hypothyroidism with increased free T3. Thank you so much. I request uh, experts to give their comment, Dr. Vinian. Uh, Dr. Vinian, sir. Yeah. So it's a very good case. And uh, with a, what I'll say, a message for uh, clinical application, because uh, a male child presenting with uh, thyroid abnormalities, especially uh, to do a T3 level and uh, free T3 and uh, combined T3. So that will <coughs> help us to pick up this. But uh, my question is uh, have you checked that, that this febrile encephalopathies are uh, described in this syndrome? Uh, yes, sir. There is, yes, sir. There is component of uh, some amount of recurrent febrile encephalopathies, which is uh, seen as like metabolic. This also has a component of metabolic etiology. So there is component of these. Uh, some means they recover. Usually they're treated as pneumonia, sir. They are not. When you go back and take history, then they give uh, examples like uh, respiratory means that is there is more tachypnea compared to the fever or cough and cold. 
but uh, usually when they go to a general pediatrician they are treated as pneumonia and they go undiagnosed that febrile encephalopathy part goes undiagnosed okay so the that that has been reported in the literature episodic weakness yes sir yes sir okay dr saha <coughs> uh, uh, thank you for a brilliant presentation regarding the case but one thing that has been apparent from this presentation is the, uh, along with the neurological abnormality, the endocrine abnormality, that should raise the suspicion for something else other than the neurological involvement. Actually, in this case, probably this has prompted the clinicians to analyze why these thyroid abnormalities is there. My question is to the presenter, uh, how you can explain the thyroid abnormalities in this case? Sir, uh, basically the whole defect, this is a genetic defect, that is uh, the, uh, the transport, the, the tra receptor defect is there in this condition, following which this causes the abnormalities in the form of, uh, that is the peripheral, hypo, uh, peripheral hyperthyroidism and central hypothyroidism. So the other name per se for this allen hendron dudley syndrome is nothing but uh, MCT8 deficiency, that is a specific thyroid hormone cell membrane transporter deficiency, sir. So due to this defect, this causes the thyroid abnormalities in the form of uh, combination of hypothyroidism in the CNS as well as uh, peripheral hypo hyperthyroidism, sir. But in, if the picture is reversed, if there is any peripheral hypothyroidism, probably you can entertain the differential diagnosis of benign hereditary choreothyrosis in this case. Yes, yes. It's a, uh, uh, new point to be noted for the beginners. Yes, thank you. Well, can I make a comment? Yes, madam, you can. See, uh, it's a very nice presentation and I uh, appreciate, you know, this whole thing. But uh, I would just like to say that whenever we are presenting differential diagnosis, it should be a realistic differential diagnosis. Once you have a child who has neuroregression, recurrent episodes, you know, and things like this, then to bring in structural malformations is not justified. So we should never bring in structural malformations in a child who has regression. So that's the first point. And any child who has regression actually is, you know, against the diagnosis of CP per se. So that's a big clue. Whenever you have a regressive disorder, then that's, you know, again, Pelizius, Mers, Barker, this is not the picture. And um, benign hereditary choreoathetosis also, again, there is no regression and recurrent febrile encephalopathies, etc. So I think the presenter has done very well, but just for the, again, for the beginners, that, you know, the differential diagnosis put, if we don't have to put certain differential diagnosis just for the sake of it, because there is no way a structural malformation will present like that, right? Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Santosh, this will be mailed to you. Yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. It will be mailed with signatures. Yeah. Thank Can you, you please allow Dr. Ramesh to allow to present for a poor Okay. Shall we start second case, madam? Please, you are the boss, na? Start. So, thank you, Dr. Santos. So, I request now a second case, uh, Dr. Rapurva, to start presenting uh, the case. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a case of a 14-year-old who uh, came with the complaints around one of year of age. The parents noticed that there is delay in the attainment of milestones. Uh, such that in the developmental gross motor domain, neck holding was at around five months, sitting with support at eight months, standing with support at one and a half years, standing without support at two years, walking with support at two and a half years, climbing stairs with support at four years. And by five years, she was able to independently take few four to five steps. But throughout the course, she needed a walking with support only from five years to currently 14 years of age. Uh, she's able to get up from sitting position and she's able to get up from lying down position. And there is swing while walking but not while sitting 
uh, in the fine motor, she could hold the pincer grasp from uh, holding pen by five years, self feeding by five years, increased tremulousness while writing currently, but no tremors while approaching objects. Uh, speech babbling by two years, she was able to speak few words by four years and sentences by six to seven years of age. Currently, the speech is slow, uh, lacks clarity, and there is increased effort while speaking. Uh, cognition and uh, social domain, she's able to follow the instructions, understanding social commands well, poor scholastic performance, but ADL, the uh, child is independent. Uh, other histories, there's increased tightness of the limbs, but this tightness is not associated with any abnormal posturing of the limbs while performing a task or any attempted movement. There is no diurnal variation in relation to the tightness of the limbs, and there is no abnormal movements in the form of twisting, flinging, or dancing movements, no feeding, uh, swallowing difficulties, no seizures, no jerky movements, no abnormal eye movements, no thinning of the limbs, no failure to thrive, no weight gain. Uh, perinatal his history, uh, baby is full term, uh, born to LSCS uh, 2.25 kg IUGR child. Baby cried at birth, admitted in an ICU on day three for neonatal jaundice, only had phototherapy requirement. During the NICU stay, uh, baby was diagnosed as PD and operated at six months for PDA closure. Uh, the baby is born out of a third degree consanguineous marriage. Uh, so in summary, this is a 14-year-old female child who was born out of a third-degree consanguineous marriage, uh, having global developmental delay, motor much more affected in the co cognitive domain, developmental stagnation and plateauing. That means after five years of age, she had attained walking with support, after which she has not improved in her uh, motor development. Dysarthria probably by history looks like a spastic dysarthria and muscle stiffness, probably a spasticity involving especially the lower limbs. So based in the summary, uh, the history, the localization uh, is the cerebral white matter and the cortical gray matter. Uh, differential diagnosis based Dr. on Rajan, the history. Should we discuss differentials here or after the examination? So because of lack of time, uh, I can continue at the end, you can discuss. Okay, fine. You can go to examination and then come back. Sure. Uh, anthropometry, it was uh, normal for the age, 50th percentile, uh, no other handles on general examination. In uh, CNS examination, uh, the child was conscious, oriented to time, place, and person. Uh, there was no cranial nerve involvement. The fundus examination was normal. In speech, there was a spastic, uh, dysarthritic speech. In uh, motor system examination, uh, inspection, there was no uh, wasting. The bulk of the muscles was normal. Tone, the lower limb uh, spasticity was much more than the upper limb. Uh, there was gastric name is spasticity predominantly uh, power there was no weakness uh, upper limb lower limb neck and trunk all uh, the, the power was uh, there was a four by five power and right and left no asymmetry uh, then uh, the DT, uh, the deep tendon reflexes the upper limb reflexes uh, were a two by five but the lower limb reflexes the knee jerk and the ankle jerk were just elicitable bilaterally <laughs> No primitive reflexes, no ankle or uh, knee uh, clonus was there. Uh, normal sensory, cerebellar, and skull and spine examination. Uh, this is the video of the gait of the child. Uh, in this video, uh, there is a waddling gait associated with impaired uh, dorsiflexion, and there is a bilateral uh, equinus. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so, based on the history and the clinical uh, examination findings, uh, the 14 year old girl with a third degree consanguineous marriage, again, a global developmental delay, motor more than cognitive, developmental stagnation, spastic dysarthria, spasticity, and hyporeflexia is the additional uh, examination finding. Based on that, the localization uh, is to cerebral white matter, cortical gray matter, and likely peripheral nerves because of hyporeflexia. Uh, the differential diagnosis considered uh, the, in the domain of pathology of degenerative etiology, degenerative pathology, uh, leukodystrophies can present with cr uh, progressive motor delay uh, with spasticities with peripheral neuropathies, but the motor regression uh, is relatively the motor regression in this case, there was no regression, so relatively the point is against uh, leukodystrophy. Uh, hypomyelinating disorders uh, in which there is a motor developmental plateauing, there's spasticity, uh, seizures are less common. 
uh, with the peripheral neuropathy. Uh, in some cases, nystagmus may be present, but not necessary to have nystagmus. Uh, then in center, the global developmental delays present uh, with intellectual delays, spasticity, dysarthria. In the adolescent age group, usually they present with dystonias and extrapyramidal uh, Parkinsonism, uh, like bradykinesia, tremors, all of those symptoms. Uh, PCH spectrum is also a, a, a differential diagnosis because of the developmental delay in spasticity, but points against microcephaly intractable seizures, though PCH spectrum is a very wide spectrum, so it could still be considered as a possibility. In genetic etiologies, hereditary spastic paraplegia plus syndromes uh, uh, is uh, another important etiology in which there is a progressive motor difficulty with spasticity, with uh, less uh, likely uh, possibility of seizures, with uh, mild to moderate cognitive impairment and associated peripheral neuropathies. In uh, metabolic disorders, arginase deficiency presents with the motor developmental delay with progressive spastic paralysis, but there is more rapid uh, progression uh, in the uh, in the uh, regression, uh, progression of the disease. Uh, microcephaly and seizures are also found. Uh, biotinidase deficiency is another finding in which late onset biotinidase deficiency can present with motor developmental delay, progressive spastic paralysis, uh, with the, though there were no skin changes and no epilepsy, but in late biotinidase deficiency, still skin changes may not be found. Uh, the outside investigations when the child presented to us, CBP, TSH, EEG, NCS was normal, IQ was 76.5 and aryl sulfatase A and B galactic. To say these levels Two minutes left for the presentation. <clears throat> Two minutes are there. <laughs> yes. uh, this is the MRI brain that was done at 16 months of age, in which the T2 weighted image clearly shows that there is a hypomyelination present uh, in the subcortical white matter areas. Uh, again, in this coronal view that is a uh, T2 hypomyelination seen in the uh, periventricular subcortical uh, white matter areas. Uh, in the next slide, in, uh, this is the next MRI that was done at 13 years of age. In this uh, MRI, clearly the hypomyelination is present and along with hypomyelination uh, in the subcortical areas, there is presence of uh, uh, brainstem atrophy along with cerebellar atrophy, which was which has progressed from uh, the one which is seen at uh, 13, uh, 16 months of age. Uh, also, uh, folia and cerebellar atrophy is found. So we went with the genetic uh, uh, analysis uh, wherein HSPD1 gene mutation was identified that was hypomyelinating leukodystrophy type 4 mutation. So hypomyelinating leukodystrophies, they are genetic white matter disorders with primary lack of myelin deposition. Uh, these are the different proteins that are associated with uh, myelin, uh, myelin uh, myelination. And any defect in these proteins can lead to hypomyelinating leukodystrophies. PLP1 is a very common abundantly found protein. Uh, the next slide, this is the pathological classification recently in 2017 uh, is uh, found in which the myelin uh, genetic white matter disorders have been classified based on myelin disorders, exonopathies, leukoexonopathies, uh, uh, dependent on uh, 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 leukoexonopathies. And uh, the, uh, this uh, has been classified HSPD1 as a leukoexonopathy. Uh, this is uh, the description of HSPD1, which is very similar to the case presentation by spastic paraplegia uh, with uh, relatively spared, uh, relatively better cognition and uh, no epilepsy and spasticity has been found like in our case. Uh, this uh, this is one MRI differential diagnosis where hypomyelination with cerebellar atrophy can be seen in Salas disease in uh, tub 4A mutations in uh, 4H leukodystrophy syndromes and in uh, 5,10 uh, uh, MTHFR synthetase deficiencies. So the main take home message from this case is that any plateau or stagnation in attainment of the developmental milestone should be a red flag to reevaluate the diagnosis. Slowly progressive pathologies can present like this without actual reg re regression of the milestones. Not all children with GDD and spasticity have cerebral palsies. In children with suspected uh, cerebral palsy, neuroimaging should corroborate with the clinical findings. The MRI scan changes can evolve over time. In case of an unusual clinical course, repeat neuroimaging should be considered. Thank you. Amazed to give comments. <laughs> no, uh, nothing. The um, uh, the clinically, it's like a static injury because 
um, there is no regression to think of a degenerative pathology. But important clinical pointer is uh, in a child who should be developing uh, motor abilities, just uh, walking with minimal support or walking independently is not the end of the motor abilities. So any child who has not attained further milestone should be uh, should always be suspected to have a progressive disease or a degenerative condition. So I think uh, that's the important uh, message for the students. Thank Raju, you can ask Dr. Lokesh Lingapa also before you're giving to Vinay and yes. Dr. Lokesh. Dr. Lokesh. No, I think what uh, Ramesh has mentioned, that should be fine. Thank you. I request Dr. Vinay uh, sir to give comments. Yeah, again, uh, clearly telling the spectrum of CP mimic. The second case is more like a spastic CP. The first case was more like a dyskinetic and uh, uh, this kinetic CP. So whenever you have a CP mimic, the differential diagnosis also changes based on that uh, presentation. So whenever you have a CP spasticity predominant, as uh, Ramesh is telling, and the presentation was really wonderful. So the hypomyelinating syndrome comes first, and uh, there are different varieties of hypomyelinating syndrome, and specifically, <laughs> One thing which was clearly pointing towards that uh, thing is historically that regression, because without regression, we will not think of that CP. But uh, again, the point was uh, <coughs> the, the walking style was a little different from CP. There was a spastic ataxic kind of a gait, I think, in that video. So that was a clue which suggests that there is something more than, especially the posterior fossa structures are abnormal there, or a brainstem is abnormal. So points is uh, when you are having a child with a cp suggested cp and then it's not following the way it is you have to and especially when a, when there is no sentinel events you have to be in the lookout of some other this syndrome especially as clearly mentioned serial imaging will help <clears throat> uh -huh. I request Dr. Saha to give comments. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oparba, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, from your presentation, clinically, it is clear that it's a case of CP mammics. Actually, uh, unlike the previous one, there is no regression in this case, which is a almost static. And one thing that is striking in this your presentation, the child is uh, being a static condition. The child was not improving in spite of his increasing age, in spite of all modalities of treatment. Actually, that is the clue to suspect that probably we are not dealing with a simple case of cerebral palsy. Rather, we are dealing with a case of CP mimics. Here, the child just presented with the diplegia along with the peripheral neuropathy on clinical grounds, but which has not been evaluated by electrophysiology. And moreover, the common differential diagnosis, as you have told, should be the either hereditary spastic paraparesis, then your deficiency, or one thing probably you have missed, there should be the lupa responsive dystina, which can present with spastic diplegia, plus peripheral and your demanding disorders like uh, MLD. But here, the peripheral neuropathy, though clinically present, but has not been detected on electrophysiology, as the biomedical findings are abnormal. That's why you can consider about the hypermonitoring disease. I think that should be the actually appropriate approach in evaluating a case of spastic diplegia with peripheral neuropathy plus spinal. Thank you. Thank you, sir, your comments. So there is one question you'll take from our uh, audience. So how can you consider spastic CP in case of uh, there is a sluggish reflexes uh, in the lower limbs? Question. Yeah, we, we should always question the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. If the reflexes are not eligible, first obviously the technique should be checked. So in this case, the, uh, that was another clue that this is not just a, a cerebral palsy. So that's when the differential, if you see, we have not kept a differential of CP. Only for the, um, uh, for the teaching presentation, we have included it because it mimics uh, mimicked, uh, cerebral palsy case. The other important point I just want to mention at the end is uh, always whenever you have a child with uh, suspected cerebral palsy or any uh, static injury, just see whether the clinical manifestations match with the neuroimaging findings. So you may have something in the basal ganglia or 
uh, which can are white matter which explains everything that you are seeing clinically then only you confirm because we don't have any biomarkers for cerebral palsy so neuroimaging is one important clue and the clinical course thank you thank you ramesh i request dr pratibha singh madam to give comments dr madam is in singhi madam Raju, I think ma'am is not Sorry, there. Sorry, I got... Yeah, yeah no, ma'am is there. Yeah. Okay. No, no, I'm very much here. But I switched yeah. off the <laughs> video and this because, you know, if you have too many videos and mics open, then the presentation quality goes down. So uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, relevant comments have been made. And as um, has been said, you have when you have clinical clues. If you don't have, you know, if you can't elicit the reflexes in a child where you're making a spastic diaplegia, then obviously there's some discordance that needs to be looked into. So these are very, very basic things, but that's how you move from basic to further uh, differential diagnosis. So you have to pay attention to the basics before we go up. Of course, genes and things will be discovered by sending genetic things. And so, but unless you suspect that, you won't go that way. So the suspicion is on very basic uh, examinations and clinical course. <clears throat> so it's a good case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So we'll go to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Gopal from SRMC and Dr. Ranjit will be moderating the session. So over to the Dr. Gopal. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. It's audible. Audible. Uh, this is a, ta a tale of a double insult with a treatable twist. Uh, myself, I am Dr. Gokul, a second pediatrics PG. My uh, moderator, Dr. Ranjit Kumar, sir, uh, epidemiologist and uh, pediatric neurologist. So, this is a case a nine month old uh, born to a third degree transplant uh, parents, dating from Velu region in Tamil Nadu. So came with complaints of a uh, uh, known case of HIE with a spastic quadri paralysis and uh, microcephaly, complaints of intermittent twisting of uh, upper and lower limbs. Uh, previous course outside, uh, antenatal history, antenatal scans were normal, no history of teratogenic drug intake, no history of fever during pregnancy, no history of uh, radiation exposure. Uh, natal history, it was a term delivery, emergency LSES in view of uh, prolonged labor. Baby did not cry, uh, at, cry at birth. The two cycles of PPV was required and uh, was uh, admitted in NICU. Uh, postnatal history, child was in NICU for nine days. Uh, detail was uh, not available. Child had a uh, seizure episode on day three of life. So uh, MRI was uh, done and it showed a mildly dilated lateral ventricle and sulcal spaces, diffuse paucity of white matter and widened uh, sylvian fissure. Uh, suggested features of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So, and uh, workup for IEM was done outside, uh, which was reported as normal. TMS was also reported as normal. At uh, eight month uh, of age, child was uh, referred to SRMC in uh, pediatric neurology. And uh, EEG was done, which showed a hypsarrhythmia pattern. And child was noted to have an infantile spasm, hence uh, was started on a uh, Vega button. So along with Viga button, I was taking uh, other uh, anti seizure medications. So child was admitted for uh, further management. This is the initial presentation. There was an intermittent uh, spasm of uh, upper limbs. So development milestones, uh, gross motor head control not attained, uh, fine motor parma grass was present, language going present occasionally. Uh, child was immunized according to NIS and uh, nutritional history according to DBF and uh, complementary feeds. Uh, family history, uh, still significant family history other than third degree consignment marriage. Anthropometry, uh, head circumference was 38.5 centimeter, which was less than minus three Z score. Systemic examination, uh, CNS examination, uh, tone-wise, there was hypertonia and spasticity in all four limbs, upper limbs more than lower limbs. Uh, reflexes were absent and uh, other systems were uh, normal. 
So there are uh, some red flags like absence of antenatal risk factors, presence of consanguinity, a neurological involvement more complex than expected, like severe dystonia, epileptic spasm, profound delay, and microcephaly. So this uh, probed us to do a whole exome sequencing and which revealed a Cuban gene mutation, which was uh, showed a emerson Grasbeck syndrome. So uh, pathogenic gene mutation was a uh, Cuban. Mm. So uh, CBC done was normal. Uh, vitamin B12 was <coughs> 99 and protein creatine ratio was elevated. Uh, urine routine done showed a protein of one plus. So impression was a profound vitamin B12 deficiency and protein area showed uh, a features of like IGS. Uh, ch child was started on methyl cobalamin 500 mg once daily and was continued for 10 days. During the hospital stay, uh, stay child showed some improvement started to recognize the mother, tone improved and uh, able to feel uh, pain. Dystonia significantly reduced. Child was discharged after 10 days of uh, vitamin B12. Uh, vitamin B12 is uh, currently the child is on vitamin B, uh, B12 weekly ones. So this was uh, before uh, starting vitamin B12. So after uh, vitamin B12 therapy, the child was able to recognize the mother. And social smile was also present, able to recognize the mother. And uh, neck holding was there. Two minutes left, Gokul. Sir? Sir? Uh, yeah, carry on. You have two minutes, Gokul. The Emerson Grasbeck uh, syndrome is a rare autosomal recessive disorder uh, characterized by vitamin B12 deficiency due to selective malabsorption of this vitamin and uh, un unusual, uh, usually resulting in megaloblastic anemia. Mild protein urea is frequent but uh, not always present. Clinical presentation. Patient usually presents with non-specific complaints like uh, failure to thrive, recurrent gastrointestinal infection, recurrent respiratory tract infection, failure fatigue. Protein urea is often but not always accompanies uh, emerson Grasbeck syndrome. So this is a normal uh, physiology of uh, vitamin B12 transport. Uh, under physiological condition, the vitamin B12 is uh, liberated from food by digestive enzyme and subsequently becomes uh, bound to uh, glycoprotein haptocorin, haptocorin, which is present in uh, leukocyte saliva. The small intestine, the change in pH and action of uh, pancreatic enzyme results in vitamin di uh, dissociation from haptocorin. The vitamin is then available for binding to intrinsic factors secreted by the gastric mucosa. The resulting cobalamin intrinsic factor complex attaches to the receptor and distal small ileum, and this is transported via transcobalamin. In uh, uh, Emerson uh, Grasbeck syndrome, uh, the problem is in uh, transcobalamin, uh, so there is uh, in, uh, insufficient transport. Um, so recent study, uh, study identified mutation two different genes, the Cuban gene and the amino amyonals gene. The classical uh, neurological manifestation are uh, due to subacute combined degeneration of the posterior and lateral column of the spinal cord, which occurs in long-standing deficiency. Neurological symptoms are reported to be generally mild and non-specific, such as developmental delay and <coughs> learning difficulties. So treatment-wise, lifelong treatment with vitamin B12 is necessary for IGS. Vitamin B12 deficiency is first corrected by giving intramuscular injection of cobalamin. Recommend do uh, dosage is 1 mg of phytoxycobalamin daily for 10, uh, 10 days. Then after these injections are then repeated once a month for the rest of the life. So prognosis wise, uh, sufficient amount of vitamin B12 are supplied. The prognosis is excellent. The protein area does not increase with time and the kidney does, uh, function does not deteriorate. The patient should be warned not to stop the treatment even though symptoms seem not to reappear immediately following seizures of therapy. Take home message. Although this patient has uh, known HIE, presence of red flags and unusual presentation prompted further evaluation. In spite of HIE, parental uh, B12 therapy significantly improved the neurological manifestation. Even in uh, patients with sentinel events leading to perinatal, perinatal insults, presence of such red flags should raise suspicion to evaluate further. Earlier identification of such rare treatable causes can be uh, clinically rewarded. 
Thank you, Gokul. So I request Dr. Ranji. Uh, it should be more clear that uh, at what stage you are considered genetic etiology and uh, any specific reason, what is the order of investigation. And uh, only thing that is appreciated is the absence of preflex. Any narrow conduction has been done. So I wanted to know that. Uh, yes, sir. So this child uh, came to us after the presentation uh, in the form of developmental delay infantile spasms when she when the baby came to us baby was extremely irritable and had a lot of dystonias uh, so this child was evaluated outside they did find bilateral frontal uh, gliosis mild patchy signal changes and atrophy suggestive of hypoxic brain injury there was no deep gray matter involvement and there is a clear cut sentinel event in the form of birth asphyxia which was documented in history and the baby had a prolonged nicu state so this child was kind of treated as hypoxic ischemic insult. So when the baby came to us, uh, the neurological presentation was more very profound and uh, the deep gray matter, absence of deep gray matter involvement doesn't explain the dystonia as Dr. Ramesh previously highlighted. The deep tendon reflexes were not that brisk, again, as previously highlighted in the case. Uh, so we wanted to evaluate further. So cerebral uh, CBC, that is complete blood counts, did not reveal profound anemia. Actually, it was like 10.5. And there was no evidence of macrocytosis in the peripheral smear. MCV was normal. So we didn't go with uh, further testing in the form of vitamin B12. Mother was non-vegetarian. So generally in our setting, because of resource limitations, if there, if the mother is a non-vegetarian and there is no clear-cut evidence of macrocytosis, we don't go for vitamin B12 deficiency. So in the presence of, in the absence of any significant antenatal risk factors, presence of consanguinity, very profound neurological involvement in addition, like which cannot be explained by the uh, MRI findings and absence of degrave matter, profound dystonias and sp spasms prompted at further evaluation. The child already had a TMS done from a government hospital, which was normal. So in view of like limited uh, resources, we went ahead directly with the uh, egg sequencing. So in that we found cubulin gene defect, which was an eye opener for us. Because even in the presence of a documented sentinel event and a documented MRI finding of HIE, if there are red flags, we should evaluate a child for presence of an additional insult, which could be coexistent, concomitant, or could have led to the presence of uh, leading, leading to HIE in the child. And luckily in this case, that was a treatable. So vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, vitamin B12 was profoundly low. We started the child on injection and the child significantly improved, spasms resolved. Surprisingly, dystonia also resolved. So my hypothesis is whether the presence of two insults like B12 deficiency on the top of a hypoxic insult could have led to severe dystonias because severe dystonia is not a reported manifestation of immersland Graysberg syndrome. immersland Graysberg syndrome typically presents in late childhood with anemia, macrocytic anemia or sometimes with proteinuria. In later childhood, they could be found to be having mild developmental delay or learning disabilities. Only in second decade or third decade, vitamin B12 deficiency goes uncorrected. That can lead to degeneration of cord, resulting in presentation like subacute combined degeneration of cord like presentation. This kind of extreme presentation with uh, spasms, dystonia has not been reported. So, only hypothesis from our end is presence of two insults, that is, hypoxic insult on the top of that with immersion Glazberg syndrome. Uh, could have led to such a severe presentation and B B12 deficiency was corrected with injection and the child significantly improved. Although we expect the child will definitely continue to have some delay because of the hypoxic insult. Uh, that was the message. So the take home message is 10 years back, probably if there was a clear cut documented HIE history wise and MRI wise, we might not have proceeded with further evaluation. That So that is a take home message. So nowadays we are proceeding with further evaluation in the presence of risk factors, even with documented sentimental event and documented MRI findings of a static insult. That's the message we wanted to convey. Thanks to Gokul, sir. He's a pediatric PG, so I appreciate his efforts. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit. So I request Dr. Uh, Vinayan, sir, to give comments. See, the, the clue here is there are two, three clues, as Ranjit has told. One thing is that uh, uh, the consanguinity. Whenever there is a consanguinity in a suspected uh, CP, there is always you have to think of something else. And the other thing is there is an extreme view. See, the point here is an extreme dyskinesia and uh, seizures, which starts very early in life. That is also not in favor of 
as CP because CP usually presents with dystonia a little later, dyskinesia later. So when you have a severe dyskinesia which is starting very early and then you don't have a basal ganglia changes to explain that, that is again a, a point which suggests that there is something else in this. And the other thing is HIE per se. See, the, the, there is an extreme view that dyskinetic CP is, is the message should not be like every CP should not be with a very clear history of HIE should go in for a further evaluation. But a dyskinetic CP, very early onset dyskinesia, very bad seizures, very early in life, that is very, very likely to be something else rather than CP unless you give get a clear basal ganglia damage and very clear history of an acute severe hypoxia, which can, man, which can have a, a significant impact on the basal ganglia. So if that is not there, all dyskinetic CPs should be investigated or a suspected genetic metabolic disorder. That is my take on this case. Thank you. Sir. So I request Dr. Narayan Saha to give uh, his comments. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cole, uh, for your presentation. Actually, he rightly said uh, the, the symptom around the presentation that is very uh, severe than the, we expect uh, that follows the parental asphyxia. Moreover, uh, because of the parental asphyxia, one should some expect some changes in the basal ganglia, but here the patient was not responding and the symptom severity was more than the clinical we expect. That's why that has prompted the uh, clinician to think around uh, a, a deviated from the parental inspection. Probably that was a clue in this case. And that should be borne in mind while evaluating such cases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I request Dr. Pratibha Singhi, madam, to give uh, comments. I think this is a brilliant presentation in the sense that the uh, treating team thought about another thing. Generally, as was rightly said, if you have a history of hypoxia and all, then you just leave it as, you know, CP post hypoxia. And Vinyan has made very uh, pertinent comments that, uh, you know, if con any child with consanguinity and CP, even if there's a history of hypoxia, which can occur with, you know, mitochondrial respiratory change disorders, etc. So there can be other causes of perinatal <clears throat> hypoxia. Any child with, you know, who was born so-called CP uh, with a history of consanguinity. And of course, he mentioned almost all dyskinetic CPs, unless you are sure of the etiology, like severe hyperbilirubinemia or severe acute hypoxia other than that should really you know be investigated in today's age and uh, date you know so it's a nice presentation and it's like a double insult on um, on um, in a child and um, it's really good that the team suspected a very uh, treatable cause of uh, the insult good thank you madam your comments so thanks, Raju, Dr. Raju, yes, Raju, one yes, second. I, one second. It is. I just wanted to make a comment as uh, taking forward from what Vinay and Saha, Dr. Singhi has said. That point is sometimes, you know, when the HI history is there, HIE may be there in a child who is predisposed to have HI due to some problem with the child, the fetus. It is it is not necessary that it is it may be in the pathway, it may not be the causal thing. Something has led to HIV. Some the child may be pre, infant may be predisposed to have HIE due to any problem in the child. So that is why having only an HIE and not taking other cues and just labeling it as CP is not correct. So I mean HI may be just be in a pathway, it may not be the causal thing. It is just happening in the pathway. It has to be kept in mind. Raju continue. Thank you, Mina. So next, we will move on to our next case presentation, Dr. Diksha Gupta. So she's from uh, Ames Rishikesh and uh, moderated by Dr. Inder Sharawat. So she'll be discussing a child with a development delay with the extraperimental symptom. So to Dr. Diksha. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. My slides are visible, sir. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Okay. Can go so beginning with the clinical case discussion, I'm doc, um, so beginning with the clinical case discussion from the Department of Pediatric Neurology in Ames Rishikesh. So we had a child who presented to us at one year of age, currently two year old. He was a resident of Pauri Garwal Uttarakhand and still is our under follow up in OPD. So he presented to us with the complaints of delay in attainment of milestones since birth. 
apart from this delay, he also had a history of intermittent involuntary twisting movements of limbs, which was exacerbated on crying and reduced in sleep. Also, he had delay in um, all the sector domains of the gross motor, fine motor, social and language, with the percentages being 40, 50, 30, 30 percentage respectively in all the domains. And the overall developmental question was 40 percent. He had no history of seizures, jerks, increased tightness, scissoring, any difficulty in changing diapers, excessive floppiness, and any visual or hearing impairment, any excessive sleepiness, or any bowel bladder problems. Apart from it, the antenatal history was also non-contributory. It was a booked and supervised pregnancy with no history of any maternal illness, and she also took her iron and folic acid supplements timely. The birth history also surprisingly was uneventful. The child was full term, normal vagina, born by normal vaginal delivery, with no history of perinatal asphyxia, any events requiring any intervention. Also, there was no neonatal meningitis or neonatal seizures. The family history, he was born by a non-consanguineous marriage, and there was no history of any sibling death, seizures, neurological illness in the family. He was also adequately fed. On examination, his anthropometry was adequate. He did not have any micro macro carefully. These are the images which was uh, which the parents had got had shown us. In this image, we can see that the child had broad forehead, sparse eyebrows, large cupped ears, and he also had convert right eye convergence squint in the right eye. Apart from this, there was no neurocutaneous markers. This is the latest image of the child when he came to us in the OPD follow-up. Again, we can see that he had sparse eyebrows and a uh, broad forehead. On CNS examination, the child was alert, active, all the cranial nerves were intact. The only finding was that the child had dystonias. Otherwise, the CNS examination was normal. Um, with the help of Vineland social maturity scale, we could calculate that the social question was 42% for our patient. His systemic examination was non-contributory. So we had a one-year-old boy with history of global developmental delay with dystonia, with no non-contributory perinatal history. Examination showing convergence squint in the right eye with some dysmorphism. So we were thinking it could be CP, but CP mimic is high, high on the cast because there was no risk factors for CP like prematurity or any perinatal events. So considering the, all the possibilities of CP with predominant dystonia, with predominant dystonia, our possibilities were This is slides are not moving. So considering CPP predominant dystonia, the possibilities we kept for neurodevelopmental more than neurometabolic because there was no history of any acute worsening um, with fever triggered worsening or any encephalopathy, and there was no history of any consanguinity or uh, vomiting. Uh, fever triggered worsening, so neurodevelopmental was kept higher on the cards, and conditions like now and related disorders, neurotransmitter defects, and NMDR receptor defects, which can present more common in male children with dystonias were kept high on the cards, and neurometabolic conditions like GCH1 related do dopa responsive dystonia, specifically, specifically because it is a treatable cause. Apart from that, conditions like cyprin reductase deficiency, glutaric aciduria type 1, lishni hand syndrome, GLUT1 disorder, and cerebral creatinine deficiency were also considered as a possible differential diagnosis for our child. We also considered acquired, co common acquired causes like hypothyroidism in, or vitamin B12 deficiency, which can also present with cerebral palsy, with high, um, global developmental delay with dystonia. Structural causes like neuronal migration defects like listen carefully or skidden carefully cannot be ruled out. So considering all those possibilities, we um, went ahead with a primary workup for a patient. The prolactin for neurotransmitter defects was normal. He had normal uric acid, CSF glucose was normal, and his thyroid profile was normal, along with the vitamin B12 levels and MCV ruling out the acquired causes. Unfortunately, we don't have the images of the MRI brain, but they had a report saying that MRI brain was normal. Again, keeping structural possibilities out of the um, possibility box now. So we counseled the parents and we went ahead with clinical exome. In clinical exome, we found that, that there was a heterozygous mutation in exon 12, which was a loss of function mutation in the green 2B gene. And this was actually, there was a two base pair duplication leading to a frame shift mutation because of which there was a truncation of the protein and a non-functional protein was formed. Also, this was pathogenic. We did segregation studies as well as recommended, but the parents were not affected with the same gene so probably this child had a de novo mutation, which is most common in a case with grin 2 b related neurodevelopmental disorders. 
as we can see the omim phenotype as well they do say that delayed psychomotor development abnormal movement disorders dystonia dyskinesia can all be seen in these patients so we made a final diagnosis of green to be related neurodevelopmental disorders so what are these actually so these are green to be related neurodevelopmental disorders happen when there are pathogenic mutations in the green to be gene this gene actually makes a protein which is essential for the nmda receptor so that there can be a proper flow of ions which helps us in the neuronal function so any mutation in this gene can hamper this process leading to epilepsy and developmental disorders this gene is located on the chromosome 12 on the band 12p13.1 and it has an autosomal dominant inheritance can have de novo mutation which is most common and as an r case also mosaicism has been reported the penetrance for green to be related developmental disorders has actually been told to be 100% and over 100 cases have still, um, been reported till now in the literature heterozygotes for pathogenic mutations resulting in null le for example if there is a frame shift mutation or if there is a non nonsense mutation or a whole exome deletion whole um, intron or exon deletion there will be actually no formation of the protein which will lead to mild or moderate id but if there are missense variants and non functional um, protein is formed it can lead to severe id the clinical spectrum which has been reported in the literature has actually been um, the percentage wise it is developmental delay which is most common like in our case followed by hypotonia epilepsy in epilepsy 2 which is generalized one is which is more common followed by focal and followed by epileptic spasms autism has also been reported which now we are actually beginning to see in our index case as well apart from that spasticity microcephaly and movement disorders like dystonia and dyskinesia seen in our child as well have been reported also there can be cortical visual impairments and squint which we also saw in our case we had a normal imaging of the brain for this child but there has been reports of malformations of the cortical development and other rare findings have also been reported so think having this possibility of green to be related neurodevelopmental disorders mimantin has been commonly been in discussion for this disorder and is fda approved as well but we went ahead with literature review before starting the medication so we found that if there is a gain of function mutation there is excessive function of the nmda receptor activity so we need to dampen it and to dampen it we have the antagonist which, which is mimantine but like in our case if there is a loss of function mutation and there is reduced function we need to increase the nmda receptor activity which can be done with agonists like elserine and this is told in a latest article so also elserine which is told to be useful in loss of function mutations many studies have been done and there is a latest study which has shown that there is improvement in behavior eeg panics and seizure frequency in individuals with green to related disorders they enrolled nine children and they had started the patients on l serine and gave it in the dose of 500 mg per kg per day in 3 to 4 divided doses what they found was that there was improvement in behavior in eight patients development in four and eeg and seizure frequency also and there were no reported side effects or adverse events similarly other studies have also been done which have shown that high doses of nmda receptor coagonist that is d serine has potential to boost the activity in lu n to b loss of function mutations and they had given it for a period of 12 months also this um, they showed that they might it may accelerate the psychomotor development and it does not have any side effects so we also purchased green um, l serine and started the patient on l serine looking for the response further just a word on memantine because it has been fda approved for green to be related disorders multiple studies have done been done on memantine as well and it helps to reduce uh, excessive activity one minute. In... one minute is there okay sir i'm just i've done sir so um, so memantine is also a drug which is um, available and we can give to patients who have gain of function mutation in green 2b gene so this is the current status of the child you can see So this child has improved in the developmental um, domain, and the child is able to walk with the help of a walking chair. The BSMS at presentation, it was the social portion was forty two percent, and now after extensive occupational therapy, physical therapy, and um, use of elsiri, we are able to achieve an improvement in social portion from forty two percent to seventy five percent. so my take home message for from this case is that in a setting with all other normal investigations 
even if the patients are not affording, we should push them to do clinical exam because it can help us to lead to a specific diagnosis. And sometimes it might even give us opportunities for treatment. An extensive search for treatable causes of cerebral palsy mimic should always be prioritized. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Diksha. So I request uh, to give comments by Dr. Hinder. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Your voice is not clear. Is like... Am I audible now, sir? Yeah, now it is on. You can go yeah. ahead now. Sir, uh, like a normal uh, normal Again, voice, is, voice is not clear. And, uh, how can it be and uh, prenatal risk factor compel us to send the genetic investigations or, and we find one pathogen maybe my internet connection is unstable yeah yeah we can start with our video yeah uh, although they uh, handful of the reports are uh, published in the literature which is uh, uh, defining the role of else in uh, uh, loss of function, uh, the, uh, two mutations. Sir. So, like uh, we exactly we cannot say whether this improvement in our child was because of the standard therapy or because of uh, a combination of the standard therapy and alcerin. Uh, so, like uh, more uh, where we detect the more cases and um, uh, uh, adequately planned RCT can give us the more efficient role, uh, give the uh, clue about the role of LCD. Thank you, Dr. Inder. So I request uh, Dr. Vinayan to give his comments. No, great case, I'll say. And uh, that clearly shows the way the uh, our the, the pediatric neurology is changing nowadays because no major clues here except for that mild dysmorphism and the absence of perinatal major perinatal issues and the findings one thing which i'll say is that that is it can be labeled as a cp if you take the general dimensional definition of cp but here there is no stagnation there is no clear regression here but still there is a role for further evaluation because there are treatable things and it might change the way we look at CP in a big way. But again, the point again is a strong perinatal risk factor and an associated MRI finding which clearly defines the injury. That is the clue. If that is not there, anything else can be there and uh, with clues or without clues. And then a great treatment thing also. Thanks, thanks to show that uh, a, a kind of uh, you work up and then Google properly and go through the information and plan. It will be all for use to the patient. Thank you, sir. So, so I request Dr. Narayan Saha to give his comments. Yeah. Uh, the cases were presented by Dr. Diksha Gupta. But one thing that is very obvious, the child actually presented from the very beginning with the CP mammy because the child has a dysmorphism along with the mobbing disorder in the very early onset of age. So for the basic learner, uh, the way they should have think uh, to be thought of about the uh, investigation process or evaluation process, one is the dysmorphology and along with the dysmorphology, there is the mobbing disorder. So if you consider the very early onset of dystonia, the metabolic disorder comes first. But as the child has also dysmorphism, so we have to think of otherwise. So there should be the two way for evaluating the early onset dystonia with dysmorphology or without any dysmorphology. There should be the learning bite in this case. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I request Dr. Pratibha Singhi, madam, to give her comments. Singhi, madam. Singhi, madam, is there? Or...
जो है तो सही पर मुझे लगा की मैम खाना वाना लेने गए नहीं मैं खाना वाना लेने नहीं गई हूँ मैम आई एम वेरी मच बट आई कॉन्ट रिस्पॉन्ड टेल आई एम म्यूटेड सो इट्स इट्स अ वेरी नाइस केस एंड ऑफकोर्स डिस्मोफिजम वॉज देयर एंड देर वॉज सेटल क्लूज दैट डिफरेंट बट मेनी टाइम्स दीज चिल्ड्रन आर ओवर यू नो kids are overlooked who have such things also just wanted to make a point that grin to be mutations are not uncommon if you see the whole uh, you know uh, spectrum of genetic reports that we have in india i'm sure that each one of us would have seen more than one uh, grin to be and it manifests in different ways and therefore you know uh, when to suspect of course you can't suspect grin to be i mean when to suspect when to do a genetic you know what are the indications for genetic testing are kind of increasing and <clears throat> increasing in the, in the sense of when uh, and that's why i keep emphasizing and reemphasizing that your clinical approach is so important um if if you have any clues at all which deviate from cp then in today's world of course you should get the genetic and uh, neurometabolic testing now in unfortunately i mean it's not easy to say this is loss of function or gain of function mutation unless you have help from the geneticist or the person who is doing the analysis and uh, we are still moving in that direction and otherwise you could end up using the wrong type of therapy and therefore you know getting these answers from uh, people who are experts in the field is also important um in that sense so indeed it's we are changing the way that we are looking at cp but that doesn't mean of course that a well established case of cp that like we'll start sending genetics for every child with cp but certainly when whenever there's a discrepancy in your clinical um you know a thing uh, and neuro radiology is normal and there are no other clues certainly it warrants uh, genetic uh, testing good thank case. you madam your valuable comments so i thanks uh, presented dr diksha and dr inder for uh, their uh, contribution so i am going to next case so uh, next is uh, dr indrajit choudhary from aims kochi so dr vaishak will be moderating this uh, case so over to the dr indrajit choudhary <laughs> good evening everyone while yeah while you you please upload your uh, slides i just wanted to make uh, another point that you know sometimes uh, when we see they will not have regression but they may be no gain of milestones you know like you are having an insult after which there will be some milestones which will be gained in cp right in those situations where you are not having any apparent reduction but there is sort of a practically no gain in milestones you know that one theoretically it could, i mean so that you have to keep a mind in that situation also that thing beyond cp alone thank you so to, oh, go to dr indrash indrashish rai <clears throat> we can start now can you see my screen yeah should be a slide show okay ah, sorry, we can start is it slide show yes sir. yeah 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 good e good evening uh, my respected teachers and thank you vyasian for giving me a scope to present here uh, my moderator is dr vaisha kanan sir associate professor department of pediatric neurology amrita gochi so i am going to present a very interesting case that we recently encountered Uh, i have named it a blue pp dilemma because it's a cp mimic so the contents will be the history and examination uh, the differential diagnosis generation review of literature when is it not cp some clinical clues and the take home messages so beginning with the history and examination uh, background history this is a 2 year old boy from maldives second child of parents having distant consanguinity they are living in the same island uh, born to a p1 l0 mother Had pre, mother had preeclampsia on uh, was on treatment with medications in the third trimester. Delivered a full term normal. Uh, de delivered a full term baby. Born out of normal vaginal delivery. Three point six kg birth weight with uh, immediate cry at birth. However, there was neonatal jaundice on day two of life, and during the routine investigations, the child was having asymptomatic polycythemia, which was uh, managed conservatively. Conservatively meaning repeat uh, hematopoietic swab done uh, and. Uh, 
subsequently the child improved so the chief complaints at 2 years of age was of the mother was that the child was not gaining milestones delay in attainment of milestones notice since 5 months of age involuntary movements occurring only in average state for the last 18 months associated complaints mother had noticed some bluish discoloration of lips and face after a febrile febrile lmti at the age of 5 and which usually becomes more evident according to the mother during this involuntary movements Uh, on probing the mother also gave history of abnormal stiffening of lower limbs with seizuring that has been observed since birth so the two main chief complaints were global developmental delay and involuntary movement global developmental delay was a motor predominant delay so much so that the partial leg holding was there hand uh, uh, used to be kept open there was no reach out for objects the child used to have cooing and uttering vowels social smile was present according to the mother the child could recognize mother to an extent uh was alert to sounds and sometimes some exaggerated startle was also there in the history the child used to fix it at light uh, but usually did not follow uh, people moving around in the involuntary movements were hyperkinetic in nature uh, some somewhat like of a sustained flexed posture of the all four limbs uh, and it was like almost continuous involving the distal extremities and trunk that used to disappear in sleep and increase when the child was agitated or in pain and this were associated with uh, the uh, sinuses becoming more prominent during this events and sometimes there were sudden brief shock like jerks as the mother describes negative history there was no history of regression of milestones no history of acute deterioration in sensorium or repeated vomiting no history of weakness of any body part or feeding issues no history suggestive of failure to thrive or increasing head size no history of abnormal body odor or recurrent infections no history of any chronic medication family history was significant in the sense both the parents were peter thalas in their career uh, the elder sibling uh, was a girl child with spastic quadriparesis and global developmental delay that child also had uh, unexplained cyanosis uh, since birth and had some involuntary movements suggestive of myoclonic jerks in infant since infancy which were being treated with multiple antiseizure medications but all eegs were normal the child subsequently succumbed at 6 years of age during during an episode of pneumonia cause of death uh, was written as sepsis cardio respiratory failure no other family members were affected so on examination the, uh, it was a, 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 the child was awake but not completely aware of surroundings the child was having continuous dystonic posturing of the trunk and the limbs vitals were stable uh, uh, abdominal respiration with a respiratory rate of 34 per minute pallor and clubbing absent central cyanosis of lips tongue palms and soles were observed anthropometry revealed weight of 10 kg which lies on 4th percentile uh, uh, height of 83 cm which lies on 7th percentile and microcephaly head circumference is 42 cm less than 1st percentile uh, regarding the head size uh, when we looked back at the uh, previous medical records uh, the head circumference had a decline over the age neurological examination revealed no neurocutaneous markers no obvious dysmorphism except a receding forehead that is a uh, suggestive of microcephaly perhaps eye contact was present but no tracking bilateral concomitants esotropia was there axial hypotonia with appendicular hypo- hypertonia without weakness was present dystonic posturing of trunk and the distal extremities were present reflexes were brisk in all four limbs and there was bilateral striatal tone rest of the systemic examination was normal nothing but is phenomenal was present so coming to the differential first is syndrome then localization etiology and the functional status so beginning with the history the parents of a distant consanguinity both of whom are uh, beta thalus in their career they delivered the el- uh, the uh, elder sibling girl who has cyanosis since birth and a developmental delay with myoclonus succumbs to illness during a respiratory illness at 6 years of age then the birth of this proban who has asymptomatic polycythemia and a neonatal jaundice at birth which was symptomatically treated then subsequently at 5 months of age the mother noticed global developmental delay with spasticity and cyanosis after a lrti infection at 5 months of age subsequently the child ends up with us with a picture of a uh, global developmental delay spastic quadriparesis dystonia and cyanosis so syndrome was this localization probably distant descending white matter tracts plus basal ganglia plus minus cortical cortical involvement because we were not sure whether those movements were seizures or not cyanosis was however not explained so the possible differentials uh, the first differential i would like to keep is a genetic syndrome 
with the predominant movement disorder phenomenal uh, probably uh, like a glut one transportopathy uh, for uh, this diagnosis global developmental delay was there like dystonia is there microcephaly is there however against is no fluctuation in symptoms no seizures inherited disorders of neurotransmitter would be a second uh, line uh, differential uh, for this statement is severe delay in all domains. Autonomic symptoms like cyanosis is there, loose discoloration. Family history is significant. Hyperkinetic movement disorder is present. However, there is no diurnal fluctuation. Neurometabolic disease would be a third possibility. Uh, the closest neurometabolic dis uh, disorder, which can be a differential, is uh, encephalopathy, petechia, and ethyl malonic aciduria, which has been reported by Vaikonti uh, 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 that uh, other ones are uh, type, type 1 glutinic acidemia, methyl malonic acidemia. Typical age of presentation is that uh, supportive clinical symptoms and family history. However, points against glutinic acidemia, like illnesses, microcephaly, and uh, MRA is negative. That is highly unlikely. Two, minute, two minutes are left. Okay. Absence of regression. Discarnity CPCP is the uh, last possible. So, etiological workup we did, uh, which revealed microcytic hypochromic anemia, peripheral pulse blood smear, target cells, polychromatophils, HPLs, beta thalassigatry. Metabolic parameters ABG showed uh, by O oxidative metro, showed a 54% methemoglobin level. The video EG was multifocal generalized epileptic form abnormality. MRI brain shows a uh, uh, wide supratentorial neuroparenchymal atrophy with thin corpus cannulas. So uh, we suspected a CP mimic in this child and which revealed, uh, we sent a whole exon sequence which uh, revealed a CYB 5R3 exon 8 mutation, the premature stop coder uh, tryptophan based 269 is pathogenic, maternal, both mother and father with carriers. So the clues in this case was history of consanguinity, no sentinel event, elder sibling with similar history, presence of cyanosis, severe dyskinesia and dyskinesia in infancy, the SR was already mentioned. And a deceleration of head. So when we uh, went to review the literature, there are almost uh, 100 cases reported till date. There is a case report of a 10-year-old girl with quadriparitic CP uh, reported by Selman Gokal. Uh, there is a uh, case series of three patients uh, of two unrelated families reported by Kalpana Madam and Mini Madam. And this is a neurometabolic disorder with microcephaly. And severe mental retardation reported in American Journal of Hematology by Prabhakar S. Keda. There, uh, uh, three Indian patients are described. So we uh, are now treating a, a similar case with an 11-month-old boy, first child of non-consanguinity, with a history of perinatal depression and sepsis and persistent central cyanosis since birth against a background of global developmental year. He presented to us with new onset dystonia since nine months of age, like posture, that disappears in sleep and reappears in awake state and is aggravated or lined up. We started following a febrile LRT at the age of nine months. So MRI brain revealed this picture. This is the market retentorial atrophy of uh, gray matter. Uh, whole exome sequencing revealed the same mutation as our index patient over here, the same premature ter 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 stop total. So probably there might be some founder mutations existing in those, that part of the island. So these are the uh, uh, picture of the uh, child we are treating now. Uh, the, you can see cyanosis, there is chocolate brown colored uh, blood. And this is a video of the dystonia. You can see some uh, tongue uh, involuntary movements in the tongue also. Dr. one minute has left. So when is it not CP? Uh, CP usually is a heterogeneous group of disorder involving abnormalities in movement of movement tone and posture caused by a static insert to uh, in, uh, developing immature brain. But red flags will be a no sentinel event. However, uh, sentinel event can coexist with a CP mini case. Uh, which causes diagnostic overshadowing. Positive family history, consanguinity, history of regression, dysmorphism, organomegaly, dyskinesia and infancy. Nowadays, in Western literature, it is still existing a dyskinesia CP. That is usually a uh, neurometabolic or bar genetic until and unless proved otherwise. Since uh, the labor perinatal care is improved, optic atrophy and sensory neural hearing loss also points towards the red flags. So, uh, this is a brief discussion on the methemoglobinemia. So, individuals with congenital methanomoglobin are typically present with cyanosis in the neonatal period. So, that's how we pick up persistent cyanosis without respiratory histories. 
and a normal 2D ego might point to this. After establishment of the diagnosis of methylglobinemia, acquired causes should be first ruled out. And when suspecting congenital forms, distinction between type 1 and type 2 essential, which is the most difficult part. Full neurological manifestations of type 2 rarely develop in infancy. Persistence analysis with neurological deficits, however, should prompt screen of type 2 in every case. Lack of normal increase in head circumference and developmental delay should alert the physician for type 2 disease, which is more severe and lethal. Methylene blue has been now advocated for acute crisis management and aspartic acid as a maintenance therapy. However, none of this treatment has an effect on the progression. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Indraji. So I request Dr. Vaishak to give his comments. Thank you for that concise presentation, Dr. Indrashish. Uh, in this case, the presence of cyanosis was the key towards the diagnosis. So if cyanosis was not there, we would have just passed this case also like an, uh, like a, just a dystonic CP because there was a history of neural jaundice also. And the point was that there was a similar history in the elder sibling who succumbed. So presence of non-cardiac cyanosis with global development delay pointed straight towards the diagnosis of congenital methemoglobinia type 2 in this case. Uh, the other rare daddy would have been APMA syndrome, uh, which he has mentioned, but he has got a completely different clinical radiological picture. Uh, but the issue lies in detecting the cyanosis in such cases because uh, the methyl hemoglobin levels may not be high enough for cyanosis to be clinically evident in such cases. And uh, it's highly possible that the cyanosis is over, uh, easily overlooked in such cases uh, because it's described that in type Peter, 2. Peter, stop project. sharing the screen so that we can see Vaishak and you. Okay. So it is described that in type 2 uh, congenital methemoglobinemia, methemoglobin levels can be anywhere between 10 to 15 percentage, 50 percentage. So uh, sometimes the cyanosis may be missed, especially in uh, children who are having dark skin and uh, if they are having presence of anemia and all. So in such cases, if we have, we, one should have a high index of suspicion. And if there is a doubt, one should confirm it with blood gas analysis. Uh, another unique uh, radio, uh, radiological feature was that this uh, the MRI picture was showing bilateral caudate atrophy, which was out of proportion. And initially, we had a doubt that it was a case of juvenile Huntington chorea because it was mimicking that. And uh, like the previously reported cases, it, it was uh, this pattern also is unique for congenital type two uh, methemoglobinemia. And uh, one take home message, one take home message would be like dystonia. If as uh, Dr. Vinian has previously mentioned, if dystonia is presenting so early in the life, like uh, maybe six or seven months, it's rarely to uh, attributed to CP. So we should be thinking of a CP mimic in such cases. Uh, another take home message in this case was that in this case, there was no direct consanguinity present, but there was a history that they are the uh, couples were from the same island. So in, uh, uh, in close communities like uh, island nation, island nations or uh, communities where they marry within the same community, even if we don't get a direct history of consanguinity, possibility of inbreeding should be kept. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vaisha. So I request Dr. Vinayan sir to give his comments. No, nothing to add. It's our case. Thank you, sir. So I request Dr. Uh, Narayan Saha to give his comments. Uh, the case is well presented by Indujit. Probably that is the classical example of neurological manifestations of the systemic diseases. Actually, in this case, the history of the previous shifts, as well as the presence of cyanosis, along with the neurological manifestation, probably prompted the clinicians to think about the systemic etiology of this disease. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I request uh, Dr. Patiba Singhi, madam, to give uh, her comments. Singhi, madam. Dr. Veda Vinayan, thank you so much for joining. Sir, we will need your comments also after Dr. Singhi, Madam, speaks. <laughs> Dr. Veda, can you please give your comments? Madam After Dr. Dr. Singhi, ma'am. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Singhi. I actually ah. don't know why my this thing gets muted spontaneously. This time I didn't even mute it myself. But anyway, I think it's a very well presented case and a very educative case. And he, as he rightly said, um, 
you know, cyanosis may not be very apparent in a small baby who is dark skinned. And therefore, you know, collecting the clues is important. Once you have that, then obviously some a bell rings in your mind that you might be looking at a situation like this. And therefore, it's kudos to the team who actually picked it up. And of course, I mean, you know, other things like, you know, severe manifestations of the other kind um, were already there. But picking up the subtle cyanosis is important. And then you, of course, can investigate further. So it's a good case. Thank I mean, you. all the cases are really good. Um, you know, kudos to everybody, really. Thank you. Uh, Thank before you. we come to the last case, uh, Raju, I'll ask Dr. Veda, please. Dr. Veda, yeah, join yeah, from one, Austin. This. Yeah. yeah. So can you speak right now? Or you want to speak after the last case? Okay, then you can present the last case and sir can speak after the last case. If he's, okay. there. he's there. Yeah. Please, please, sir. Please yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a very well presented uh, uh, case, and uh, I think the discussion was very uh, enjoyable and uh, entertaining. My only question uh, is, you know, if if this child had cyanosis, you know, how how significant? Why don't other children say who have bad, you know, cyanotic heart disease? Why don't they develop CP to the same extent? Or is there any thoughts or any, you know? Anybody has any ideas or? That's a very relevant question, sir. So the uh, the crux is that in this case, it's not the methemoglobin which is leading to the CNS insult. Because in uh, there's type 1 and type 2. In type 1, there will be only methemoglobin only cyanosis, and they don't have any CNS manifestation. But in type 2, what happens is that even though the mutation is the same for both type 1 and type 2, in type 2, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, NADP reduct is this enzyme is deficient in all tissues. But in type 1, it is only in the RBC. That's the difference. So apart from the uh, redu uh, participating in the redox re uh, re uh, reaction in the RBCs, this enzyme has got a role in housekeeping in other tissues also, like CNS, especially in the lipid oxidation defects and all. So apart from, independent from the methemoglobinemia part, this enzyme has got a role in housekeeping and that the mutation in that gene directly per se can cause the uh, uh, CNS insult rather than the methemoglobinemia causing uh, CNS insult. So it's a more global energy depletion state. Yeah. Yes. Sir. That's very interesting. Yeah. Raju. Raju. Dr. Raju. Last case. Raju got logged out. Uh, Asvita, you can. Sh uh, I hope you shared Indrajit's post uh, uh, certificate, which we have been giving to all from the beginning of all the SIGs. And uh, uh, then we can have the last case, please. I think, I think, uh, he, I think uh, Raju got logged out. We can have the last presenter starting the case, please. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, but full screen. Yeah, sure. So, uh, uh, good evening, all. I am presenting on behalf of PGM or Chandigarh. So, uh, the learning objective of my case is the importance of general physical examination in a child presenting as a spastic diplegic cerebral palsy. Uh, coming to the child, we had a three-year-old boy who was uh, a resident of Punjab, informants being father and mother. He came with the chief uh, con concerns of inability to walk independently and uh, speech delay at the age of three. Uh, so uh, to begin with, I would like to start the history from the antenatal period. Pretty much it was uneventful till uh, 33 weeks of uh, gestation. Uh, so there was a preterm onset of labor at around 33 weeks, one weeks of gestation. And an emergency LSCS was done in view of a non-reassuring MSG and thick MSL in early labor. Uh, it was uh, done under GA. So uh, the baby's birth weight was 2 to 78 uh, grams and the baby cried at birth was labeled as a vigorous MSL. 
and the child developed respiratory distress at two hours of life for which the child received oxygen support uh, for 36 hours of life. And there was no history of neonatal jaundice or any seizures uh, during the NICU stay. And the baby was discharged on day, by, day of five of life with the OFC documented a discharge of 31.8 centimeters. So uh, coming to the uh, concern regarding the developmental delay, so in uh, gross motor sphere, the child uh, started gaining milestones a little later in the initial uh, infancy. And he started sitting with support around 12 months of age. Now, at three years of age, he cannot stand with support. He uh, For mobility, he bottom shuffles and walks with both hand held. Uh, in the fine motor domain, uh, child uh, can eat with spillage, which is uh, amounting around 2.5 years. And in the language, now the child can speak around two to three words at uh, three years of age. And in social milestone, a uh, child is able to uh, indicate bladder bubble can wave bye-bye and uh, has a parallel play uh, three years of age. The DQ in gross motor being uh, 33, fine motor being 50, the language uh, DQ of around 33 and social DQ of around 63. So there is a global de delay, uh, a motor and a language predominant delay more than the social uh, domain. So uh, there was no history of convulsions, no history of uh, any uh, hearing or visual problems. There is a history of crossing of legs if made to stand or walk, uh, like when he is made to walk with hands held. And there is a progressive stiffening and tightness of legs noted from infancy. There was no history suggesting any extrapyramidal movements or uh, cerebellar symptoms. Uh, there was a history of uh, dry and scaly skin, which was uh, noticed from eight months of age, and it was associated with itching. There was no uh, other history suggesting uh, an extra genetic startle start or an excessive irritability, and no history of worsening during intercurrent illnesses and no history of any loss of attained milestones at any point of time. Uh, so the past history was, was unremarkable. Uh, Treatment-wise, uh, he was being told as a child of uh, cerebral palsy and was on regular physiotherapy. For the skin issue, the child was receiving some uh, topical medications before presentation to PGI. Immunization, he was immunized for age. And uh, uh, in the family history, there was uh, one uh, history of a similar skin rash and uh, global developmental delay in his uh, cousin. So uh, at the end of the history, we kept the uh, differentials of uh, spastic diaplegic cerebral palsy considering the early onset of labor and the neonatal course, a perinatal tort sequelae because there was a pre-term onset of labor and a neurometabolic disorder with a predominant white matter involvement, uh, involvement and skin changes because of the uh, family history. So treatable conditions like vitreous deficiency, holocopsis synthesis deficiency, which can present with a uh, spasticity and uh, in changes and uh, second differential we considered under the neurometabolic group versus Jogger and Larson syndrome, multiple sulfates deficiency and a uh, urea cycle defect like arginine deficiency, which can present with a spasticity predominantly involved in the limbs. Uh, coming to the examination, vital wise, the child was stable. Anthropometry revealed the child being underweight and uh, severe stunting with a normal head circumference for age. Head to toe examination uh, revealed a mild uh, facial dysmorphism in the form of a uh, frontal bossing versus widening, hypertelorism, epicanthus inverses, a prominent uh, philtrum, hair and nails were normal, pallor was present, and the skin showed a generalized ichthyosis associated with scaling and etching with accentuation in flexural areas and extremities. And there was a relative sparing of the face compared to the flexural areas, and there was intense pruritus, which was observed during the examination. There was a cafe de macule over the right thigh. And abdominal genitalia was normal, mild kyphosis on spine examination. Uh, so we can appreciate the dysmorphic uh, features uh, given in the head-to-toe -to examination. There was a mild hypertelorism and then epicanthus inverses, a prominent philtrum and a frontal bossing. We can see the uh, dry, scaly skin uh, with the hyperpigmentation and hyperkeratosis around the ankles, around the umbilicus and in the groin region. And we can see in the axilla, child is actually scratching uh, when the photo was taken. And uh, there is uh, some uh, scaly ichthyotic lesions over forearm also. And this is the cafe macula over here. So the neurological examination, uh, child was conscious, playful, oriented to parents. There were no cranial nerve deficits. The child was able to fix and follow objects. No extrapyramidal movements. Sensory and other examination were essentially normal, expect, except for the kyphosis in the spine. Motor examination revealed a uh, bottom shuffling, scissoring of legs with heel first walking when made to walk. And the tone was increased in all four limbs uh, with a predominant lower limb involvement compared to the upper limb with spasticity in all four limbs. And there was uh, exaggerated DTRs with the bilateral ankle clonus and bilateral adductor hip contractures were there. Uh, 
so we can see the child can fix and follow well in the video and uh, relatively preserved upper limb function child is able to perform a fencer so uh, the child keeps the legs adapted when held in the uh, vertical suspension and we can see the toe first walking with the crossing when the child is made to walk with both hands held so uh, this is the video showing the bottom shuffling done by the child and the other video showing uh, brisk dtrs in lower limbs with an uh, ankle clonus bilateral so other system examination was essentially normal and uh, we have at the end of the history and examination a 3 year old boy who presented with a concern of delayed development and history revealing a perinatal insult in the form of preterm onset of labor being a vigorous muscle with an oxygen requirement for initial 36 hours there is a global developmental delay some uh, skin problems and born out of a non consanguineous marriage family history of uh, global developmental delay with skin problems in person and examination revealed uh, an underweight severe standing normal ofc pallor signs of vitamin d deficiency global developmental delay generalized ichthyosis with flexural accentuation and kyphosis associated with uh, like ichthyosis is associated with pruritus and a spastic diplegia with ankle clonus and bilateral hip and uh, adductor contractures two minutes so, left for the so coming to the uh, a spastic diplegic cp pretty much uh, all the points have been discussed in history uh, so uh, so in examination we have a preserved combination uh, cognition motor predominant delay and a spastic diplegia and the points against were a normal head size and an ichthyosis which prorates which is not common with a spastic diplegic cp in the uh, top or tors equally there was no history of jaundice abdominal distension no hepatomyositis on examination normal head size fundus examination was normal and the ichthyosis with prorates is an again a point against Uh, in the organic acidemia we considered bitrates deficiency and holocarbocylase synthetase deficiency so points in favor examination revealed a spastic diplegia but the child had a normal head size ichthyosis with pruritus which doesn't go uh, with these two differentials and there were no dystonias or ataxia to explain the extrapyramidal involvement so for a jogerel rasa syndrome almost everything was fitting in but we couldn't uh, find the pathognomonic you no know, uh, white spots in the fundus examination and multiple sulfates deficiency again and the head size was normal there were no other uh, extra neural features like dystonia ataxia hypotrophomegaly or core spaces no signs of neuropathy and uh, for a urea cycle uh, defect there was one thing in favor which was spastic diplegia and these things like ichthyosis and dystonia absence of dystonia and ataxia goes against so for a complicated her hereditary spastic uh, paraplegia the, child has a spastic diplegia actually it was not a pure paraplegia and ichthyosis again doesn't explain so we uh, proceeded with an mri mri uh, t2 weighted image showing uh, bilateral periventricular uh, t2 hyperintensities in the deep white matter in the subcortical white matter with sparring of the subcortical u fibers and we can see uh, involvement of corpus callosum in the splenium and genome also and t2 uh, flare images showing uh, similar changes and at in t1 sequences the areas involved time, uh, time is up can you wind up fast on yes. so they are all high summarized t1 yes i'm done sir three more slides uh, so uh, coming to uh, mri with t1 hypo intense and t2 hyper intensity with no deficient restriction and susceptibility weighted imaging considering the clinical Uh, periventricular predominance and the clinical features of ichthyosis with spasticity jogren larsen syndrome was the uh, clinical hypothesis based on the examination and history and we proceeded with the genetic investigation which revealed a pathogenic mutation in the exon 5 of A aldh3a2 gene which is locally localized in chromosome 17 p11.2 uh, causing jogren larsen syndrome uh, so uh, this was first uh, described in uh, norway in a part of 28 cases by dr t jogren and it is an autosomal recessive disorder i am involved in fatty alcohol oxidation so coming to the clinical features the classical triad is uh, of ichthyosis spasticity and intellectual disability which is seen in almost all patients with uh, uh, jogren larsen syndrome 
and other important features to note are the yellow white lesions of retina due to uh, alcohol accumulation in the fundus and then intense pruritus because of the elevation of the leukotriene B4 uh, and a premature birth which is mostly seen with many of the cases. So a diagnosis is made with an MRI brain and an MRS. MRS shows a prominent peak at 1.3 and 0.9 and biochemical assays show a deficient activity of uh, fatty aldehyde dehydrogenase. So treatment, no specific treatment at present, multidisciplinary clinic is uh, like care is uh, advised. Vitamin D therapy is important because they have a defective skin barrier because uh, that doesn't cause any uh, inherent vitamin D protection. So vitamin D therapy is almost required in all patients. These are the investigational therapies uh, which are being investigated. Uh, fatty aldehyde scavengers is, NS2 is the drug's name, which is under phase two trials. Others are the proposed drugs which can be tried. So take home messages, uh, whenever we see ichthyosis plus uh, spastic diplegia and intellectual disability, this is a classical trial. We should suspect jordan Nelson syndrome. It mimics spastic diplegic CP in every other way. A general examination finding of ichthyosis with pruritus clenches the diagnosis in a child with a spastic diplegia. And it is a preventable genetic disorder because if we have one child, then prenatal testing is possible if we have already the mutation. And vitamin D therapy should not be missed as the skin barrier is compromised. These are my references and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sujata. So I request Dr. Arish to give her comments. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, just that, uh, thank you, Dr. Sujata, and she has well explained, sir. Just a simple, this is a simple case. It just highlights with the message that we've already been giving uh, in this uh, session today that try and collect more peripheral clues in children with CP so that uh, even if the parents are not forthcoming with those concerns, so they can help uh, pick up the CP mimics. That will be also thank you. Thank you. I request Dr. Vinay sir to give his comments. Yeah, it's a very perfectly well presented case, and then a, a relatively straightforward case with that kind of a clear skin marker there in the beginning. But uh, that gives a kind of uh, completes the spectrum. I'd say that the spectrum of CP mimic, starting from uh, very clear clues in some cases, and uh, some cases there are apparent clues, and some clear some cases it's a serendipitous. Uh, uh, treatment, uh, serendipitous discovery of a, a, a cause which is treatable. So it is. This is all happens in our clinical practice and a nice a spectrum of cases, I'll say, and uh, a great learning experience. Thank you. Thank you for inviting today. Thank you. Thank you. So I request Dr. Narayan Sao to give his comments. Okay. Uh, the case is well presented. Actually, this is a classical example CP plus. Actually, whenever we are dealing with a CP mimics, initially the child just classically presented with CP mimics, but here there is a clue for the presence of actiasis. So, in a suspected cases of CP mimics, one should look for the is there any clinical clue either from the history or clinical examination or any investigation. Actually, that might lead to the underlying cause of this CP mimics. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, I request Dr. Pratibha Singhi, madam, to give her comments. Singhi, madam. Ma'am is not there. Okay. okay. So there is a comment from Dr. Nihal Reddy. He has mentioned that uh, they have noticed uh, some polymicrogarial like changes in green 2B mutation that are presented by Dr. Uh, Indrajish Group from AMS Rishi case. So that is also mentioned in their literature review. So that may be an indirect loop or to suspect uh, this crypto mutation. So I thank uh, all the presenters and also their okay. moderators. Raju, Dr. Veda, uh, Dr. Veda wants to ah, say something. Okay. Dr. Dr. Veda. Veda? Uh, very entertaining. I mean, it was very, uh, you know, interesting. Uh, presentations by everybody. And uh, I just wanted to reiterate, uh, you know, Dr. Gulati, what you had mentioned, that you could have a double hit, and especially as a neuromuscular medicine person. Uh, it's not uncommon. You can have a baby who's got a say, severe form of congenital myopathy or neuropathy, and then have an additional problem from hypoxic injury. So it can be sometimes 
also to be considered. And also the other factor is sometimes you may have a genetic disease be present in a child with CP and uh, present with increasing motor problems as a consequence of that, uh, especially. But it's a very interesting, um, and I think congratulations to everyone who participated. Thank, thank you, thank sir. You. Uh, thank Vinayan, last message, any last message? Vinayan, Sal. Dr. Singhi. Last message, take home message. We are very much past time. So just one message. Cannot hear you. From whom? Yeah, I'm saying any any, any last message, take home message. From me? From me or? Yeah. Uh, from yes, you, you, I, you. I already. Any one found last out. message. Yeah, nothing yeah, yeah, more. Just, so nothing the more. point point is very very clear that uh, the case was the cases were well presented, and that shows the variety of uh, pediatric neurology and the uh, I'll say the uh, the interesting part of pediatric neurology at this point started with uh, very few investigation and very few diagnosis in the past, and it has moved forward and reached this level, and it is going to go further. And all the best for the young minds here. Dr. Saha? Yeah. Uh, the, actually, all the cases are well presented and probably that has covered the all the spectrums of CP mimics. Actually, one should consider CP mimics when there is a uh, there is no history or risk factor related to the CP as well as the other presence or absence of other abnormalities that leads to a clue for underlying etiology. That should be the take-home message from the today's presentation. Thank you for asking me to be to be present Thank over you. here. Thank you again, ma'am. Thank you. And Thank to you. all the Thank audience you, and speaker. Yeah, Allah, Thank you, pleasure. Ma Thank you. Raju, you want to give a message? You have been moderating. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So uh, actually that uh, now recently there is a guidelines also published and uh, when uh, children with cerebral palsy develop delay, which group of disorders uh, should be evaluated with genetic analysis, there is a guidelines also. MRA classification for cerebral palsy is given. So based on that, uh, there are five groups. So usually uh, that is in detail. So group A, B, and uh, D requ e requires definitely the further investigation. And uh, C and uh, B usually they are perinatal inserts. So it gives more clear picture when you should consider the genetic analysis for these children. Raju, I think we have to take out a position statement on this. And I think or some review, we have to do it from AOC inside. So you please uh, lead that, right? Uh, but one thing, a take home is not going for exome mm -hmm. <laughs> directly. You have to see the patient. Your history is going to give you 90%. Your simple, simple cues are going to be there. Annual examination, family history, very important. And, you know, simple, simple cues, you know, the development trajectory, family history is going to give you information. And uh, then you understand what is not you know, CP, because the definition of CP, whether to have, you know, exactly that is also debatable, whatever, you know, so you have this, it's been a mixed bag, but the insult is one time, that is one thing is there, but uh, but as we have discussed, and, and really, I'm grateful to all the participants who from across India have been able to present so wonderfully well in a, such a short span of time, and it's really, uh, one feels really proud and privilege, you know, and I feel really happy that in 2004, when we start the DM Pediatric Neurology Program with Mahesh being the first student, and Raju is what serial number? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Three, four, your serial number? <laughs> Three or four? Five, okay, five. So, five, five. I mean, we've come a long, yeah, five, okay. We've come a long way and really feel very, very happy about the same. I hand over to you, Mahesh. Yes, and um, yeah. Uh, I'm sure all of you enjoyed the, today's thesis. I thank all the presenters, their mentors, uh, experts for today's session and the uh, moderator of Ipin Raju for connecting the session very smoothly. Uh, next week again, we'll be having another activity by the CPSIG, the details of which I'll be putting on both uh, WhatsApp and the emailing to all the UC members. I expect a uh, similar response next week also. Uh, thank you. Yeah, listen to him. He's the first DM pediatric neurologist in yeah. India, right? And those who are not members, please become the members of AOC. And, and we'll be mailing out the membership forms and the link uh, in the next mailing, uh, which goes. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Yeah.
Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.